Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to The Underground with Josh Cohen. I am your host, of course, Josh Cohen. Um, very excited to talk to you guys uh, today. I'm excited to talk with you guys every week, but especially today. Why, you ask me? Well, I'll tell you why. Um, I did a profile of the, uh, the dreaded Venezuelan uh, faux dictator, um, some would say president, not me, of uh, Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. Uh, last week, I've published a, a column on it for Ken, Kennington Press, and I've also published an article on it for Unfiltered with Josh Cohen, my blog. And what happened today? Guide you to the screen. Maduro has been charged with drug trafficking, um, trafficking cocaine, uh, Colombian cocaine, up to uh, America. And uh, he's been caught on it. Uh, earlier this morning, uh, breaking news from the New York Times, Venezuelan leader Maduro is charged in the U.S. with drug trafficking. Federal, uh, federal prosecutors uh, accuse President Nicolas Maduro of participating in a narco-terrorism conspiracy. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, peers, friends. I've never heard the term narco-terrorism. Perhaps you have. Um, uh, it's a very cool phrase, though, I have to say. And it seems to be one befitting Maduro. Uh, in a major escalation of the, of the Trump administration's efforts to pressure him into leaving office, you will recall at the Trump State of the Union address, he both uh, repudiated Maduro as the, uh, as the president of Venezuela while propping up uh, opposition leader Jose Guerrero, excuse me, uh, opposition leader Juan Guerrero as the uh, proper president of Venezuela and had him, had him present uh, uh, in the session. And um, I'm very excited. Um, I could cite, we will cite later on some of the human rights violations, which I think should go part and parcel, or at least follow axiomatically to these drug charges that have been brought. But for now, we'll accept the drug charges. Don't forget, Al Capone was never actually indicted on any of his crimes as a gangster, as a murderer. Um, he was, in fact, uh, imprisoned for tax evasion. So if we can get him on something, we can at least get him on that. Fox News reported earlier today as well. Uh, they say the U.S. Justice Department, excuse me, the U.S. Department of Justice on Thursday, today, unsealed a searing criminal indictment against Venezuelan socialist leader Nicolas Maduro and several co-conspirators, accusing them of an array of narcotics and trafficking-related crimes, including efforts to struggle drugs into the United States. Uh, at a press conference on Thursday morning, Department of Justice officials announced a slew of charges pertaining to Maduro's conspiracy to commit narco-terrorism. There's that wonderful word again. Um, it's almost lyrical, isn't it? Which carries a minimum of 50 years behind bars. 50 years, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and again, that's before we go into the, the human rights violations of uh, Maduro. The DOJ underscored that while he is currently in Venezuela, the 57-year-old is known to travel outside and is now offering a $15 million reward for information that will lead to his capture. Not bad. Not bad. Um, I like this for a number of reasons. Number one, obviously, um, the, the uh, thought of him going to prison. Uh, albeit for drug trafficking and not for human rights violations, or perhaps, as I, as I mentioned last week, um, potential violation of the Genocide Convention. Um, uh, I, I like, A, the fact of him being behind bars, B, the fact that given that he's 57 years old, this will be an effective life sentence that he'll be serving, uh, should be, he be convicted, of course. Um, but I do want to tack on to this case uh, this wonderful news that's, that's come to light. Um, as I mentioned, not the drug trafficking itself, but indeed the human rights um, uh, violations that he's done. So uh, I had mentioned last week, and I'm going to expand on it a little bit now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the International Criminal Court. <clears throat> Excuse me. So according to the Human Rights Watch, this was an article published September 2018, which would have been uh, the year that these charges were brought. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Six governments have uh, taken an unprecedented step in, excuse me, in requesting the International Criminal Court to open an investigation in Venezuela. Uh, this was said by, uh, as I mentioned, the Human Rights Watch. On September 26, 2008, the governments of Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Paraguay, and Peru, along with, oddly enough, Canada, as I mentioned in my, my uh, blog post last week, uh, that I cited last week, referred the situation in Venezuela to the ICC prosecutor, Fato Benzoda. Um, I apologize, Mr. Benzoda, if I, uh, if I uh, besmirch the, uh, the uh, pronunciation there, for investigation. This is the first time that uh, ICC member governments have sought an investigation of potential crimes that take place entirely on the territory of another country. This is unprecedented in the history of the ICC, and as I mentioned last week, ladies and gentlemen, um, Part and parcel of becoming a member state of the ICC is that you're also a member of the Rome Statute, which uh, Venezuela has been uh, a member state of since 2001. 
<clears throat> and uh, these charges were originally brought to the ICC's attention way back in 2014, in fact, which was a year after Maduro took office. Uh, they go on to say, um, this unprecedented step, let me try that one more time. The unprecedented step reflects the growing alarm among many countries about the human rights catastrophe, ladies and gentlemen, uh, italicize and underline that, catastrophe that has overtaken Venezuela. This was given, this statement was given by uh, Jose Miguel uh, Vivanco, uh, America's director at Human Rights Watch. With the request to the ICC prosecutor, these governments are making clear that the total lack of justice for Venezuela's ongoing abuses is unacceptable. Um, this is what I've been saying for some time now. Uh, in two crackdowns, in 2014, as I mentioned, and 2017, Venezuelan security forces committed systematic abuses against critics, including torture, uh, which Human Rights Watch uh, research shows, and we'll be sure to leave a link in, uh, in the uh, description section below for that to elucidate that question. Uh, they detained more than 5,400 people between April and July 2017. Members of the security forces have beaten detainees severely and tortured them with electric shocks, asphyxiation, sexual assault, and other brutal techniques. Um, Human Rights Watch research also shows that the abuses were not isolated cases but were in fact uh, the result of excesses by rogue security force members instead Various, force, uh, various security forces committed widespread abuses repeatedly over a period of several months in multiple locations across the country, and uh, including in, gov in controlled environments such as military installations both in 2014 and 2017. That is as clear cut a case as could possibly be made um, for systematic ab abuses by government. Uh, the Venezuelan government, and uh, one that the, the ICC has considering, I'm sure is considering, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. <clears throat> and uh, I would hope that our uh, friendly prosecutors here in America will consider as well, not just the, the, the civil, but indeed the criminal as well. Um, by the way, if I didn't mention it already, uh, among those uh, officials that were arrested or being charged along with Maduro um, is uh, their chief justice. So that should give you some insight into the, the level of corruption that we're seeing at the, at the high systematic level within government. Um, that, uh, that is effectively my case for, um, for Maduro. I want to keep you guys informed on this. This just broke earlier today. Um, actually, full disclosure, I actually had a guest booked for the show today. Um, and we, uh, we basically moved to, he asked that we move into next week so we could do service to this, uh, to this Maduro story. Um, and I, uh, I have an article coming out on this as well, which will be featured on Carrington Press. It should be published later tonight. It will most certainly be published by the time you see it. Um, and I want to move on now, actually, to, I don't want to mention the coronavirus. I made the promise with you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, last week that I, I will not endeavor to cover coronavirus because I, I, do, I do believe it's drenching the media at the moment, and with good reason, of course. But um, I should instead like to use the coronavirus catastrophe to talk about the role of government, that, uh, the role of control that government should have in our daily lives. Not just in the normative, but in the extraordinary as well. Um, such as, what do we do when we're faced with a global catastrophe, a global pandemic such as this? Uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues over at Kennington Press just penned this piece called, his name's Josh Aitkins. Um, by all means, check him out. Liberty and the fear that destroys. And uh, in it, he writes, uh, he says, like with other events, the public has succumbed to fear, looking, to, looking for the government to take them by the hand and guide them through these uncertain waters. What will it all cost the American public? Damn good question, if you don't mind my saying. Dollar cost aside, we already know this will cost uh, in the realm of billions, if not trillions. There is uh, a more important side cost that uh, most refuse to consider. And then he finishes by saying, let me be clear, this nation will get through this time. Uh, what will that nation look afterward? Uh, excuse me. What will that nation look like afterward? Considering just how easily the free society willingly gave in to into the temptation of the government apple. Like the Christian story of Adam and Eve, once you take the forbidden fruit, once you bite the forbidden fruit, you can no longer undo your actions. That's a great line, isn't it? Uh, when I read that article, I was absolutely furious. <laughs> I, uh, I wish that was, my, that was my piece that I wrote. Um, 
And I think I'd like to um, pose an answer to the implied question within that. As I mentioned earlier, what is the role that government should take? And um, you'll have to forgive the scrappy slide here, um, but I'd like to reference the Constitution. Um, Article 1, Section 8 specifies the powers of Congress in great detail. The power to appropriate federal funds uh, is known as the power of the purse. And it gives Congress a great authority over the executive branch, which must appeal to it for all of its funding. And the federal government borrows money by issuing bonds. That's, of course, a, an extremely um, uh, limited, what shall we say, uh, passage of the entire uh, uh, of that section. But effectively, it, it lays out what is the role the government should play. Um, they should be concerned with border control, for instance. They should be concerned with, as they say, um, funding um, their military branches. The role of government itself, ladies and gentlemen, should be very limited. And there should be a great fine line that exists between um, this limitation and our daily lives. And uh, I have just a few quick notes, uh, several things that I believe that um, government should uh, not be involved with, um, if we can help it. And, uh, and I, I do believe in more, more cases than not we can. Welfare, healthcare, abortion, and, and various social issues. Um, the abortion question, uh, in my own uh, view, I'm a pro-life man myself. And uh, I would argue that abortion falls into, folds into, uh, the promise set forth by the Constitution where it, we are meant to preserve life. Government is meant to preserve life, pursuit of happen happiness, and pursuit of liberty. It's my understanding, it's my belief that if one can secure the pursuit of liberty, then the, or the pursuit of, yeah, excuse me, the pursuit of liberty, then the pursuit of happiness would follow axiomatically. You need not pursue it if you have liberty and life uh, already taken care of. But um, that is, in my summation, uh, under normative circumstances, the role the government should play. As far as catastrophic situations like this, this is very tricky. It's very, very odd. Um, I, I am slightly afraid, more than slightly afraid, uh, of the idea that government can just wave its hand and uh, you have how many businesses now closed um, in uh, uh, our own fair state, Minnesota. Um, I live about a mile and a half from Main Street in my city, which is primarily all bars and, uh, and restaurants. And now it's starting to look like the Wild West. Uh, I'm just waiting for the tumbleweed to, to roll across, right? And um, I, I, I fear that government has this power. Under these catastrophic circumstances, perhaps, but I think a, a line needs to be shed between what the catastrophic is and again, as I, as I risk repeat myself by saying, the normative. And that was what I had for you guys uh, so far. Really appreciate it. Uh, and get, again, I'd like you guys to subscribe to uh, KenningtonPress.com, which I write for. Um, I want you to subscribe to uh, certainly the underground. Um, leave a comment below, smash that subscribe button, hit that notification bell as well. I'm going to be that guy. I'm, I'm going to do something that no one's ever ever done before. I'm going to say it. Smash the subscribe button. I'm going to say it again for you. Um, really hope you guys enjoyed. Hope it was illuminating. Um, and uh, tweet it. Share it. I want to see maybe smoke signals. However you guys want to do it. Just get the word out. Come to the underground. Come to Kennington Press for all your news that isn't currently being met by the mainstream media. Thank you.